Good morning, everybody. My name is Kathy Smirla. I'm one of the pastors on staff here at the Vineyard. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, you guys are looking good today. You're the most well-rested group that I have seen today. So thanks for being here. If you're joining us online, thank you so much for joining us. So if you are, have been coming to Vineyard for a long time or you're brand new, the program is the best thing for you guys to check out this morning. There's a little welcome paragraph in there. Also, all the different things that are coming up in the next month or so. So take a look at that at some point. Today, uh, we're going to have a time of worship, but you guys are special. We get to be witnesses to some baptisms this morning, and that's very exciting. That'll be part of our worship today. Uh, then Pastor Mark is going to uh, preach a, an awesome message today, and then we'll have a time of prayer. And as we get started and we think about worship, you know, for me, I have been working the last few years at becoming a better worshiper. Like, I've really wanted to grow in that area, and so uh, I think God's helping me do that. I have a lot, play a lot of worship songs at home, in my car. My favorite place to worship and to grow in worship is right here in this place uh, for so many different reasons. You know, God tells us that we're supposed to meet together. He tells us that we're supposed to worship together, and it's for his sake because he deserves it, doesn't he? He deserves our worship and our praise, but I also think part of the reason is that we can encourage one another as we worship. If you have been having a bad day uh, or a bad week, maybe the person next to you hasn't, and their worship can encourage you. I was watching somebody last week uh, as worship was happening, and this person was so focused on God, you could just tell by their face and everything that they were doing, and it touched my heart, and it made me want to worship better. And so that's what we can do for one another. I hope that's what we do for each other this morning. And I would like to read a verse to help us get ready for that. So would you stand? And I'll read this verse, and then we'll get started. It's from Psalm 95, and it says, Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for He is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. So Father God, I pray that together as the, the church, your body, that we would worship you and that we would honor you, that we would give you the praise that you are due this morning and we'd encourage one another as we do it. I uh, pray that you would bless Leah, bless the whole worship team as they lead us this morning. In your name we pray, Jesus, amen.
to hear a couple testimonies connected to some activity of God that's been going on in a couple people's lives. We have Melissa and Isabella. And so I think, Melissa, are you going to come up first? Come up over here. Everybody say, hi, Melissa. Hi. See, they're so nice. Aren't they nice? They're nice. There you go. Hello, everybody. My name is Melissa, and this is my personal testimony. My story is two-pronged. First, my life before Jesus was lonely, and I didn't know why. I felt I had to be perfect and always came up wanting. I had a lot of anxiety and would hold on to negative feelings. I thought I knew God and the story of Jesus and even prayed, but my whole heart wasn't in it. I used retail therapy to make myself feel better and would get into debt and have to have someone, usually my parents, help me out. I even filed for bankruptcy and still didn't learn and continued to have financial problems. Finally, I came up with a plan to get myself out of debt and I distinctly remember praying to Jesus on my way to work, not for money, but to help me stick to the plan and maybe not put huge obstacles in my way. Later that morning, an attorney I rarely worked with, I'm a paralegal, gave me an envelope with $20 cash and a note that said, good job. He never did that before or since. I knew instantly that it was Jesus saying he had my back. $20 wasn't life-changing, but it kind of was. I have kept up with my budget over the years and have helped friends and family come up with budgets. I no longer have such anxiety to be perfect and now when I pray, I pray with my whole heart. The second part of my journey to Christ started last summer when I turned 49. I was extremely unhealthy, both physically and mentally. I was nearly 50, and I had so much living I wanted to do. I started making drastic changes to improve my health and started praying more for guidance on the mental part. But an obstacle came in my way when in the fall someone wronged me and I was filled with anger and hostility. I prayed and prayed to let that anger and hostility go. Finally, a few weeks ago, as I was praying, I literally felt all that anger and hostility leave my body and a peace come over me. It was then that I felt a calling to come back to church. I have always viewed my relationship with God and Jesus as very personal and private, that I didn't need to go to church to have a relationship with them. These past few weeks, I have learned that I was wrong. Today, I am making my relationship with God and Jesus public. Hi, Isabella. How are you? I'm good. Good. Are you nervous? Yes. No. Yes? Yes. Look at all these people. Everybody say, everybody say to her, we're nice. Does, does that help? No. Oh, it does. Okay, good. Everybody say hi, Isabella. Hi, my name is Isabella, and this is my personal testimony. My life before Jesus was very rocky. I had so many days of me not eating or just hurting myself. And if it wasn't for Jesus, I probably would be in a mental hospital for months. But thanks to Jesus, he was helpful. Me see in my darkest times. One time I tried a vape at only 12, but Jesus knew my stress. Most days I feel numb or feel like I'm worthless, but Jesus made me see I have people who care about me and made me feel happy. Hey, Isabella. Will you just read it again because it's so good? Sure. Okay. My life 
before Jesus was very rocky. I had so many days of me not eating or just hurting myself. And if it wasn't for Jesus, I probably would be in a mental hospital for months. But thanks to Jesus, he, was, he has helped me see in my darkest times. One time I tried to vape at only 12, but Jesus knew my stress. Most days I feel numb or feel like I'm worthless, but Jesus made me see. I have people who care about me. It made me feel happy. Hey, Isabella, Isabella, would, I'm just kidding. She gave me this like, what? Thank you so much for sharing. Melissa and Isabella are going to go over and get ready for the, could I say, uh, sacred ceremony of baptism. Super important. Now, by the way, baptism, getting in water, doesn't forgive us our sin, it, it, but it's a step of obedience it's a representation of what God is doing supernaturally in our life. Uh, I think the water, no, I know the water represents the washing away of sin. It re can represent the washing away of just stuff from yesterday and the new start that Jesus gives us. The water also represents uh, the Holy Spirit. And uh, being engulfed in the Spirit of God, which includes the power of God, which brings strength and health and, and oftentimes uh, a more joyful experience. So there's a lot of symbolism there. Uh, when Melissa and Isabella get in the baptismal, uh, you'll probably notice that the leaders are going to be asking them a couple questions. Just so you know, here's what will go on. Before they get baptized, they will ask them something like, do you believe that Jesus is the Savior of the world? And they'll answer the question. Then they'll ask, is Jesus Christ your personal Savior? So it's not just about, oh yeah, Jesus came to save the world, but he came to save us. And we have a personal need for the reality of Jesus in our life. Uh, and then the last question is a lordship question, and it'll go something like this. Will you, as best you can, will you obey God? Will you follow him? When he says to go this direction, will you do it? And if you make a mistake or fall short, will you get back up and then keep trying to follow? That's a very important question. And so that's what's going on in the pool, and then they will baptize them. They'll take them back into the water in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And you'll be able to watch that happen either straight here or we'll probably have it up on the screen. And uh, oftentimes, of course, when they come out of the water, we celebrate. So if you want to applaud, you can. Does that make sense? So let's pause and pray. Father, we pray especially for Melissa and Isabella that this uh, would be way more than just some religious ceremony, that this would be significant. We ask that, we thank you, Lord, that because of Jesus Christ, they are and have a new start. And we pray for an increase of the power of the Holy Spirit in their life to give strength and direction and hope and all the things that you bring, God, to us as we walk with you. And it is an honor for us as a church family to celebrate with them and also to see, Lord, again, that you are moving among us. So we thank you for your activity. In Jesus' name.
that you be seated for just a moment, and I'm going to talk at you. Um, oftentimes during baptisms, during testimonies, uh, I don't know, I have some ideas, but I don't know why God does it, but the gospel gets clear. I think we hear other people's story and we relate to it. And so I just want to take a, a, two minutes and clarify salvation because that's what Melissa and Isabella are talking about salvation is a two I would I would argue it, it involves two things one is being saved maybe you've heard people talk about that oh I got saved it's saved from the consequences of my sinful past um, most of us understand consequences um, because when we get wronged, there's something in us that makes us want to wrong someone back. It's in our makeup. It's, it's, a, it's the idea of justice. Like, whoa, 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 whoa. You stole my cookie? I'm going to steal your cookie. Because somebody, because I'm without a cookie here, and someone's going to pay because I don't have my cookie. And I think it was you took my cookie, and so someone ought to make things right. It's a horrible illustration, but I'm making this up as I go. Does that make sense? Uh, I think sometimes humanity, we would like to think we're real, we're real merciful. Like, oh no, everything's good. But when you get wronged, we understand a sense of justice. Um, and when we are sinful, there is a very real sense of justice from God. When we do sinful things, there is a punishment that should happen to us. Jesus took the punishment on the cross. He took our punishment so we can be forgiven for all the stuff that we should be punished for. So that's part of salvation. And the other part, salvation is an empowerment to live differently. It is an empowerment. It is the Spirit of God that helps us walk through this life, not distant from God, but filled with Him so that we can live differently. That's part of salvation. Salvation, if you didn't know this, is not just about heaven. It is also about walking out today with God in us, with more peace than we should have, with more mental stability than we do, because God in us makes us better. Does that make sense? And I think when we hear testimonies, there's part of that. It's in the midst of all that. So, here's something I want you to think about. I'm not going to do an altar call, but I would ask you, if you're not saved, if you've never said, Jesus, I need all that in my life, you should really think about it. Uh, I think we live in a world where we reach toward all kinds of things to save us. We hope in all kinds of things like, oh man, I know what I need. I just, you know what would save me? A better income. That would save me. Or you know what would save me? A better therapist. That'll save me. You know what'll save me? Uh, you know, we, we put our hope in things. Can I just tell you, some of those things are nice things. Nothing, nothing will bring salvation to your life except God and Jesus Christ and the Spirit in there. So, if you're, uh, you know, new at this church gig or hanging around with us, or maybe just today your eyes got opened, like, I need that. Whatever those two were testifying about, I need that. The answer there is Jesus. And we'd love to be a church that can help you, you know, know Christ. And there you go. Got it? Okay. Father, we thank you for this time of worship. We thank you for salvation for many of us. And for those of us that may not have it, I pray, God, that you just keep knocking on their door and that they would have the courage to respond. It's our honor to try to honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you've been sitting for a while. I want you to please, if you would, stand up, take 30 seconds, greet the people around you. If you're in middle school, you're dismissed to core class, which is if you go out the back door, there should be a teacher there. 30 seconds to be friendly. Go.
Hey everyone, I'm Ryan Cameron. And I'm Sarah Kovach, and we're on staff here at the Vineyard. We're so glad you're here today. If you are new with us, we hope you have a great experience. And if you have not filled out a Connect card, it might just be the best way to get connected with staff and others from the church. If you're on site, the card is in the seat back in front of you. You can drop it off at the Welcome Center. For those of you online, there are helpful links in the description. What are you making? Art. Uh, uh, I just wish there was some way I can combine my creativity with my love for scripture. But there is. We're offering a new one night workshop called Creative Bible Journaling, taught by an artist and fellow Team Vineyard member. During this class, you'll discover meaningful ways to combine art, drawing, and scripture. And don't worry, no artistic skills are required only the desire to enhance your spiritual life. Visit the Vineyard app to learn more and sign up. And you know what? Here's another upcoming opportunity, but this one will help you to lead more effectively. There's a four-week class called Nehemiah Exploring Biblical Leadership. Nehemiah was a godly leader who knew how to respond and get others on board to carry out God's will. We'll dig deep into the book of Nehemiah and examine his experiences to learn how we can lead more effectively. You can sign up or learn more at the Resource Center in the atrium or online. As you may have noticed, 2022 is our year for more baptisms here at the Vineyard. The hope is that if God is doing something in your life and baptism is your next step, a chance to be baptized would be at most a few weeks away. And our next opportunity is the last weekend of July. If God has done something significant in your life recently, it may be time to get baptized, even if you've been baptized before. So if this is for you, visit thevineyard.org slash baptism for more information. We're about to move into our message time. So before we go, for those on site, if you've kept a cell phone on, we ask that you silence it now. And if you've kept a child with you and they get too restless, we ask that you take them out to the atrium where you can still watch and listen to the message out by the fireplace. Thanks, Thanks Vineyard. Vineyard. It's me again. Thank you for everything you've been doing. You don't know how much I really appreciate it. I'm still having some problems with my son. I need your help. Will you please help me? me again. Good morning, you guys. My name's Mark Pope. I'm the lead pastor at the church. Good to see you. That's nice of you. Also want to say hi to the folks at home. Might be watching online. We hope you're having a good day. Uh, uh, just I guess one thing for me before we get into the talk, uh, we appreciate your generosity around the church. I know that many of us discipline our lives to try to uh, make an offering uh, to God because just to honor him for what he does in our lives. And so we appreciate your generosity. It helps ministry move forward. It's so wonderful to be part of a church that leans into generosity uh, so that most of our conversations have to do with how to do more ministry and how to affect lives and and not wondering about how we're going to pay bills. So thanks so much for that. Let's pause and pray about the offering. God, many of us will give to you. Uh, some might give for the first time. Others, we've been doing uh, the spiritual discipline of giving, tithing, beyond that for years and years and years. But as we do at this weekend, we hope that you will feel loved and honored and as usual, I pray on behalf of our, the leadership team at the church, I ask you, God, to give us financial wisdom all the time with any financial decision we need to make because we really want to be great stewards of your money. And we want to see tons of ministry happen. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Amen. For the talk this weekend, we're going to be in Psalm 30. By the way, there are some books in the Bible that are really hard to find. You ever been around the Bible and think, where in the world is that tiny book? The Psalms is kind of in the middle of the Bible, and we can find this book. If you're in a paper Bible, there's 150 Psalms, pretty easy to find. It's in the Old Testament. Uh, And of course, you can use your phone if you'd like to look it up. Psalm 13 is where we'll be. Uh, Introductory thought, the last several months in our life, in my life, has not been perfect. Have you ever had like a season in your life that were a little bit rough when you're like, wow, this is not the best time? Uh, Some examples, we have a a good friend who's diagnosed with cancer. We've had uh, three people in our, basically our immediate family have had little surgeries over the last several months, which is really rare for us. And one of them did not go great. So if you ever had, you know, where you go, oh, here's the plan, and this will happen, and this didn't happen. Well, it didn't quite happen the way we, uh, they had hoped. Um, other things. Oh, I know. I know that I look like I'm in incredible shape, right? I mean, I know that deep down you think underneath this shirt I am ripped. But actually, it ain't happening. And... And I now, but for the first time in my life, I have this back thing, you know, that I'm like, I'm not sure this is ever going to go away. Last night in a service, somebody said, hallelujah. <laughs> right? But so I'm thinking, and I've prayed about it, and I've had people pray, and I'm like, ouch, still. I don't know. It's just a new wonderful thing of my age. I'm well into my 30s, and Gee whiz. Okay, so I got that going on, which is new. Like just in the last couple months, I'm like, what is that? Am I going to live with that the rest of my life? Um, How many of you over the last several months, like you kind of thought you had a sort of an investment plan and then 2022 hit? And you're like, okay, maybe not so much. Uh, And then this last Friday, not two days ago, but, um, well, no, wait. Last Friday, uh, my wife was in a, car accident. She's fine, but the car is not great, and so it's just adding a level of hassle to trying to get the car fixed, and whether it's the result of COVID or all that stuff, it may take forever. Like, we, I called the body shop, and it's kind of bizarre because they said, hey, yeah, this is the body shop, and they, their first significant uh, spiel was, just so you know, it might take forever to get your car fixed. They was like in their greeting because of parts and this and, right? No? It's like, so that's going on. And then I got this text uh, just two days ago on Friday uh, from my wife. And here's a little bit of the text. This, this may not seem significant, but she clarified, the text will come up. She said, this is a flower, not a weed. So I had mowed over her flowers, not a great moment. And then she went on to say, the sprayer stopped working. I can't get the power washer to work. Everything is broken. And she triple crying emojied me. (laughs) Triple. Like, I don't even like, that's like, that's not just tears. That's like gusher crying. I don't know what that is. But she triple emojied me. And so that was Friday. I share those thoughts to introduce an idea that I think most of us will relate to. Have you ever had a where are you God moment? Where it feels like, this is at least what I, where it feels like God is not really doing his job. Psalm. 23.1 says, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. And you want to say, my pasture is looking pretty brown, God. (laughs) And maybe if you could, does that, have you ever had those? I'm guessing most of us have had those moments. And just to be clear, my season's not that bad. Like, we're, we're doing okay, and well, the car will get fixed and all those things. So compared to some of you, this is not a bad season at all, because you've had a time that was like tragic, death, the sudden death of a loved one, or right? So different people, different times. 
But it brings up a question, how should we pray during difficult days? When you feel like, what in the world is happening? How should we pray during difficult days? Now, part of the assumption there is that we still pray during difficult days. And I, like, I want to bring a little bit of a challenge here. Please do not, when you go through a difficult time, please do not decide. That is not the, the time to just blame God and stop talking to him. Will you hear that? It is not the time. That's one of the plans of the enemy of your soul to do that. Not a good plan. I just was in a conversation. Uh, but I have conversations like this fairly regularly where someone will say, well, this happened and I really haven't prayed or I quit church, you know, four months ago because they went through a hard time. And they end up, here's what happens. We end up blaming God instead of approaching God. That is not the right plan. A couple Bible verses, Matthew eleven twenty eight. Jesus said, come to me. All you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. Away from God is a bad plan. Psalm 34, 17. The righteous cry out, the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He saves those who are crushed in spirit. We should not go away from God during difficult times. We should go toward him. But well, how do we pray? What should we say? So hold those thoughts. We're in this series called When You Pray. And today we're going to learn from Psalm 13, where apparently the writer, whose name is David, kind of a big deal in the Old Testament, apparently is having a where are you, God, moment. Now, I would love to give you the details about what was exactly going on in his life, but we don't know. David was a warrior, so there's some indication maybe it's a, he's losing battles and he can't figure out why. Uh, David was a king, so maybe it was like leadership stuff or part of his team wasn't working. David uh, was uh, a father, a husband. By the way, he, in this Old Testament days, like he was more than a husband to one wife. He had like a whole big giant family. Who knows how many kids? So you wonder, well, there are probably a few of them being a pain in the Rumpelstiltskin, you know. If you, had, if you had 364 kids, probably one of them is a little irritating. I don't know how many kids he had. But right, maybe it's that stuff. But something's going on that's not going well. And he writes in this psalm, How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. And my enemy will say, I have overcome him. And my foes will rejoice when I fall. Verse 5, but I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. Now, it's just a six verses, and I just thought, just to honor God's word, we just read it twice. So let's just read it again. By the way, if you're doing Bible time, and you're reading the Bible, and something uh, feels living, like, oh, this is good, go back and read it again. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes, or I will sleep in death. And my enemy will say, I have overcome him. 
and my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. The title of the talk this weekend is Praying Through Pain, Approaching God in the Hard Times. And probably among us there are people, your life is good, you're in a good season, don't worry, a bad one will come. Right? This is life. But there's also some of us might be in the middle of a difficult season right now. And so I thought as part of the prayer for the rest of the talk, we would also just take a moment and pray for anybody. If right now you're in kind of a hard season, if you want to stand, we're just going to pray especially for you, for you during this time. Anybody in a hard season? Thanks for standing. Yep. And so church, you know, if this is your home church, you kind of know the drill. Did you know you do not have to close your eyes and bow your head to pray? Some of you are like, what? No, really you don't. And so I'd ask you to just keep your eyes open and focus on one of the uh, folks that's, that's praying, I mean, sorry, that's standing. And they're like being vulnerable saying, hey, life is hard right now. And so can we just pray for them? So Father, we see these. Uh, we don't know what's going on, but you do. And so we pray a few things. Give them strength, I pray. We pray together. We pray that you would intervene, that this difficult season would be short. And maybe even today, you'd just fix it. We pray that you would be close to them. <laughs> I pray that they would not avoid you, God, but that they would run toward you. We just ask for your help in their situation or situations. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks for letting us pray for you. And church, thanks for praying in that. I've got two ideas here of how to pray during hard times. Uh, the first thing is this from the text. When it comes to hard times, get things off your chest. It's basically the idea of let God know how it feels. I think that's what the writer, whose name is David, is doing in the first verses. He seems to be pretty honest here. Where, when he says, how long, Lord, will you forget me forever? That feels pretty honest. How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? He's just doing this gut, honest, go to God, tell him what it feels like, what's going on. And there's two things that I just observe here. One, of course, David is just, I don't feel like David's holding back. He's honest with God. And the second thing is, apparently, God is okay with this. There's no rebuke. He, he listens. In fact, there are so many examples in the Bible of heartfelt honesty to God. I'll give you some examples. In Psalm 130, one person writes, Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. In Psalm 6, 2, Have mercy on me, Lord, for I am faint. They're not faking it. How, how many times... Do we sort of kind of fake it with people and people say, how are you doing? We say, oh, I'm good. Don't do that with God. If you're about faint, probably you should let him know. Hey, did you know he knows anyway? I can't, you know how dumb we are sometimes. We say, no, I'm not going to tell him. I don't want him to know. Hello, he knows everything anyway. <laughs> right, have mercy on me, Lord. I am faint. Lord, my... Here, my bones are in agony. My soul is in deep anguish. I, it, it almost feels dramatic, doesn't it? Like this is a dramatic person. My soul is in anguish. Ah. Uh, Psalm 18.4. This feels really dramatic. The cords of death entangle me. The torrents of destruction overwhelm me. 
The cords of the grave coil around me. I feel like I'm in a dramatic presentation of how hard. This is really bad. So I'm from those verses, I'm going to give you a theological idea. Apparently, you can write this in. God has a high threshold for dramatic people. Because it's all through the Bible. And maybe they're... And I almost never, almost never does God rebuke or criticize people that are just being honest about how it feels. And it's important to know that many times God just not, he doesn't just have a threshold for it's okay, go ahead and share. God actually responds to the people who are honest and go to him about their situation. I'm going to give you an assignment in 1 Samuel 1. There's a story of a young lady who's going through a difficult long season. Her name is Hannah and she just wants to have a baby and it's just not happening. But beyond that, it's even more difficult because her husband, this is Old Testament, her husband has another wife, and, her, and, and his other wife is having all kinds of babies and is just mean about it. So if you read the chapter, there's a sense of probably something like this is going on where whenever Hannah, of course, can't get pregnant, but this other woman, Penina, just keeps getting pregnant. And it describes Penina in verse 10. It says, this went on year after year. And whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival, that's Penina, provoked her till she, provoked her till she wept. And so she would be mean to her about Hannah's... Uh, inability to get pregnant and she would just be mean until she would cry. And I don't know what that looks like, but you know, something like, oh gosh, I'm pregnant again. What's wrong with you? Wouldn't that be mean? Just, you know, you must be broken. There must be something wrong with, that just, whore. so that's what, where Hannah is living. The super wise thing about Hannah is recorded in verse 10 and it says, in her deep anguish, Hannah posted a prayer request on Facebook. No, that's not what she, Hannah got a group together and she told all about how... That, it says Hannah prayed to the Lord. That is so smart. Now maybe she shared with other people... But her emphasis, according to the scripture, was she took her pain and her trouble to God. By the way, ultimately, she not only gets pregnant, she gives birth to uh, a prophet who becomes a major part of God's story to rescue humanity. It's amazing. But part of the story is in her anguish, she went to God. She went to God. She's honest. In fact, if you read the chapter, it's worth reading. At one point in her prayer, she's so honest, vulnerable before God. One of the priests, kind of like a pastor guy at the church, because she was praying at a, at a temple at the church, he's observing and thinking, she must be drunk. But she was just letting it out to the Lord. So this detail, this will just come up on the screen. It's not a fill in the blank, but Hannah lets her emotions go in the direction of God. That's what she does. So that raised a question for me in my prep. Do I do that? And I was sad to say, not so much, mostly. You know, do any of us have, I have, a great capacity to, like, whine to myself or complain to my wife, or sit with others and have a venting session, right? Well, we're just going to vent. It's okay, just vent. Or post, you know, post, anybody post our crabby, whiny disappointments on some social media thing? And what I would say here, this is a new thought, 
fill in the blank, what would happen if our hours, <laughs> what would happen if our hours of whining turned into honest prayer? What if instead of complaining to human beings, who, by the way, <laughs> never mind, that was not a good tangent. I can probably, who, by the way, can do, can we just be honest, very little to fix my aching back. I mean, they can do their best, and we can try. Do you know what I mean? They, and God bless physicians. But do you know what I mean? They, how, can we just admit how totally or significantly unprepared people are to fix us or the situation? Can we admit that? Not that we can't be helpful. Did I just feel like I need to dwell? If you're putting your hope in people, that's minimally a second best decision. We should be taking this stuff to God who has power and a heart to help. That's how we get things done. And so back to this idea of what would happen how might it transform our lives, our families' lives, our friends' lives, our community lives, if instead of voicing our complaints, wah, 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 that's a, I learned that in Bible class on preaching. Every once in a while you're supposed to go, wah, 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 wah. no, but if we instead turn those things and thought, oh, wait, I'm starting to complain, and actually prayed to God and said, God, I was going to just talk about this situation or just whine about it in my brain. Will you intervene in this situation? Gosh, I think that would change a lot of things. Luke 18, 7 says, will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? So to finish up this point, bring it into the room, here's a question. What have I been whining about? <laughs> my back, my schedule, politics, violence, the neighbors, the neighbor's kids, the neighbor's dog, the neighbor's whatever. You know how, instead of that, how about we just decide to make a huge shift in our life and let's just pray. So what have I been whining about? The second thing is cry out to God about it. Good preaching, Mark. That's what I thought. Oh, that was pretty good stuff. That's helpful. Maybe it wasn't good for anybody, but that was helpful for me. It's changed even my prayer life this last week. Prayed a lot more this week when I start to get all irritated with something. All right, so that was the first point. When it comes to hard times, get, it, get things off your chest. The second one is this. When it comes to hard times, end, talking about prayer time, end with reestablishing trust. Re-establishing trust. We're talking about re-establishing trust with God. We'll get back to the text in a moment. But this last week I had an important meeting. Um, and uh, it was a lot of times with important meetings, good meetings, what you want is good, healthy dialogue and discussion. By the way, some of you are like, no, no. Yeah, differing opinions often help us get to the deeper, better truth. So it was a church meeting. And uh, went through this meeting, and there was some challenges, but ultimately we ended up at a really good place, good decisions. Uh, after the meeting, I was in a conversation with one of the pastors at the church, and he said to me, oh yeah, and by the way, are we good? And we were good, I was fine. But you know what he was doing? Since there was differing opinions in the meeting, he was coming back around and making sure the relationship was still good. Does that make sense? If you ever, you know, it was like, oh, and by the way, because this matters, are we good? To our text, I would submit to you that the first part of David's expression to God is fairly tense. 
perhaps friction when you're saying to God, how long, Lord, will you forget me forever? I don't think that's a warm and fuzzy, you know. He's not saying, will you forget me forever, right? This is not a song. He is voicing his frustration, like, will you forget me forever? But I love verse 5. It is the maturity of David where he, at the end of this, says, but I trust, to me this is a reset of his relationship with God, but I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praises for he has been good to me. Do you feel it? The reset back to, but we're good, God. He's confessing, he's confessing, he is, but I am good with you, even in the difficulties in this life. Here's the idea, you can write it down. A spiritually healthy time of prayer ends with a moment of peace. It ends with a moment of peace. It reestablishes your, wait a minute, okay, yeah, this is hard, yes, this is difficult. I don't understand why you let this happen. Breath. But I trust in your unfailing love. But I trust you, Lord. And we're going to go on from here. I want to give, that may not sound really easy. I'm going to give you three keys to doing that just from those two verses. All right? So if you want to have peace with God, even in difficult times, at the end of your confession and prayer and frustration, here's three things to think about. One is, you can write this in, remember his love. It's the first thing in verse 5, I think it is. But I will trust in your unfailing love. By the way, that's kind of a decision of our will at times. And it might, what's helpful to me is to remember the cross of Jesus Christ. Because sometimes anybody ever think, oh God, don't you love me? The answer to that is yes. He proved that 2,000 years when he sent his son to die on the cross, when they beat his son to a pulp, when they took a whip and they tore open the flesh on his back. I should, we should, if we get a grip on that reality, although we can question and wonder why this happens, we ought not ever really wonder whether God loves us or not. Okay? Does that make sense? Well, yeah, but I ran over the weeds. I mowed over my wife's weeds. God, you must not love me anymore, or you would have told me that was a flower. Really? No, don't go there. God sent his son to die on a cross for your sin. Your sin, when legitimately, legally, he should have said, because of all that, I'll never talk to you again. And instead he said, well, because of all that, I'm going to send my son to die on a cross. That so we can trust in his unfailing love. little side note, might not be right, but it feels like I should say it. We cannot expect of God he will give us answers to all of our questions. It never says, you know, we can trust that he'll answer why this bad thing happened. Sometimes he gives us insight, but he owes us nothing, you guys. He does not owe me an explanation for why, my, why he's letting my back hurt. Does that make sense? He owes you, I'm sorry, I realize this might be a new thought to some of you, because, because, he owes you, just to be clear though, he don't owe you squat. Well, he better tell me, oh, whoa, no, he owes me nothing. He doesn't owe me anything, which by the way, when you embrace that, that's what makes it so amazing that he would actually love me because he does not owe me anything. But he sent his son, and yet he wants to be in relationship. Okay, back to the notes. 
Remember his love. Celebrate salvation. David says, my heart rejoices in your salvation. This is a great mood booster when things are difficult. Think about salvation. Whatever difficulty you're going through now, if you're in a difficult season, can I tell you, in salvation, in heaven, when this all comes to pass, it'll all be good. There is not a pain that you're feeling now that you will, it will, you will feel in heaven. If you're in Christ, all that stuff that right now brings friction or pain or whatever, it'll all get better. Every bit of it. Your irritating neighbor, if they're in heaven, they'll be awesome in heaven. Does that, like the physical things you're going through in heaven, there'll be no more pain, no more tears. Does that, so that thing you've struggled with, so don't discount the reality of, oh, by the way, these things are difficult right now, but celebrate and rejoice in your salvation. Like, oh yeah, there's good things on the horizon. So celebrate salvation. The last thing is recall the good things. Recall the good things now and don't get overwhelmed with just the difficult things. A little more information about the surgery that didn't go great. Uh, it was a surgery for my son. His name's Isaac. Some of you know Isaac. 25 years old. And he had a, a, a surgery, a thyroid surgery. And while they were doing the surgery, uh, they um, accidentally uh, cut a nerve that goes to his vocal cords. And so that will affect his voice. He'll have a, what, this is what the physicians are saying, six to 12 months of therapy to get his speaking voice back. And this was, and, and they said, now we're praying, right? How many of you know we love doctors, but doctors aren't the final say on everything? Did you know that, did you know that God is actually smarter and more powerful than a doctor? Some of you are like, no way. Yes, he actually is. And so we're praying. You know, because they, they said, oh, because what they said was, but you won't ever be able to sing. Which is kind of a big deal for my son, because he, he is a musician, and he leads worship at the church that they were going. You know, so anyway. So, when as a dad I hear that, I'm like, oh, come on, God. But one of the things that helped me was I remembered and recalled the good things. And I thought, okay, yeah, this is a bummer, but Isaac has a solid relationship with Jesus Christ. Wow, that's a good thing. Isaac has a job and works hard. And do you know what I mean? And I thought, wow, oh, that's a good... Isaac, he got married a couple years ago. He married a phenomenal woman. Isaac. So I, what I did was I did not... Dis yes, there might be a difficult season, but I made sure to recall and remember the good things. That's super helpful. You may be in a struggle now. Don't let the one struggle overshadow the good things that God has been doing in your life. I will sing the Lord's praise for he has been good to me. So if we can recap the ideas from the text. When it comes to hard times, get things off your chest and end with reestablishing trust with God. Why don't you stand and we'll close.